So the first thing that I knew of my baby Margot was a foot. I'd had bad cramps all day that got progressively worse to the point that I felt a foot coming out of me. And I promptly told my friend Imogen to call 999. I was having a baby. Out of those in my house, besides me and my friend, three of them woke up when they heard Margot cry. And one of them slammed the door in my friend's face, thinking that the idea that Maisie had a baby on the upstairs landing was just an early morning joke. Having a baby on a landing, no painkillers or medical help, isn't something I'd recommend. What I would recommend is actually knowing you are going to have a baby, but this isn't a luxury that every woman experiences. I experienced something called a cryptic pregnancy. Um, I'm guessing most people haven't heard of that term before, but it's a lot more common than you might expect. A 2002 report by the British Medical Journal estimated that one in every 2,500 births are a result of cryptic pregnancies, which is about 320 births a year. The term also encapsulates women who find out they are pregnant after the six month mark, when it is illegal in the UK to have an abortion. Once you scratch the surface, there's actually a lot of documentation out there of women who've also experienced this. There's a TikTok about a flight attendant who gave birth in Australia, I think she didn't realise she was pregnant. Um, one of the midwives in the hospital told me that another midwife had had not one but two cryptic pregnancies. Um, of course, newspapers such as The Sun grasp onto details like this to create clickbait headlines for Facebook, but they never detail much past the actual birth for the obvious shock. Nowhere is the parent's mental health discussed, nor the practicalities of having a child thrust upon you that you didn't know existed until 10 minutes before. The lack of knowledge of a pregnancy of course comes with an increase in danger. Like my situation, many women have not, don't have enough time to not only realise they are having a baby, but to get to hospital as well, meaning they are giving birth in unsafe environments without the proper equipment and often alone. From my own personal experience, Margot was already born by the time paramedics arrived. There is also the question of whether the mother or baby is suffering from any undiagnosed issues, such as preeclampsia, that could affect the birth. To reiterate the physical seriousness of this situation, had I been taken to hospital, I'd have had emergency C-section straight away. There would have been no question over a C-section because Margot was feet first. I had no choice. Um, to give birth naturally, I had to do it, but it was the worst possible way that that could have happened. Um, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists states that home births lead to double the risk of perinatal death and triple that of neonatal seizures or serious neurological dysfunction, as well as the risk to the mother of hemorrhaging and increased time to get advanced medical help should something go wrong. And that's an expected labours. I'm in no way trying to come across as though as a denouncer of home births. However, I feel like in my case, it's important to note that due to the combination of an unknown breach birth in a student house, there's a very high chance that something should have gone very wrong physically. Unfortunately, not all of the stories have a happy ending due to a significant chance of babies passing away because of a lack of knowledge in their delivery. In the past, mothers have even been charged with infanticide even the case is the same as mine. There's a shocking theme of an intense amount of blame being placed on women when their bodies do not work in the way that men have written that they should. There's not only the physical health, the mother and baby to think about, but also the mental health of parents as well. Looking back at my time in hospital after Margot was born, I can see now that I was definitely in shock and yet I was never treated as such. I was never given the opportunity to speak to a therapist or psychiatrist about it, what I had gone through whilst in hospital. And I was expected to make decisions on the basis that I was not in shock. At my six week checkup, I was told to watch out for PTSD, yet I was never told how PTSD can manifest itself when dealing with this type of trauma. For seven months, I was alone dealing with these symptoms, such as disassociation, without realizing where it actually stemmed from. I'm thankful for the support system that I have around me because looking back, I realise how badly the situation could have spiralled out of control due to the combinations of trauma, postpartum depression and the effects of societal pressures. Despite the many, many negatives of COVID-19, for me it was a bit of a blessing for my mental health. By the time the lockdown was announced, I was really crumbling from the weight of social pressures that I felt were being placed on me. 
Not only was the issue of feeling like no one believed that I genuinely didn't realise I was going to have Margot, there was also the shame that I felt that I hadn't behaved like we expect expected mothers to do. I also felt incredibly judged for returning to my architecture degree as quickly as I did. I felt like I was in a massive fishbowl and everyone was just waiting for me to sink. Whilst I've always been sympathetic to the fact that many people don't know what to say in my situation, there is a line between between being cautious and making light of a difficult situation and just being rude. I don't feel that in some social circles I was afforded the same degree of respect and courtesy that we usually show towards new mothers. I've been ignored, I've had people compare pets to my newborn, and I've had jokes blatantly disrespecting my trauma sent to my boyfriend. To me this behaviour clearly shows that amongst my peers in society we don't respect birth trauma in general. I imagine that the reactions would have been very different had I been hospitalised for an event such as a car crash. But for some reason, the minute a child is brought into question, we feel like we are allowed to critique everything about a mother's existence. Surprisingly, the people that I felt I've had to defend myself most to are people who don't have children. And I'm willing to bet that they still would not make those comments that they have done to people who had a conventional pregnancy. When comments are made about me downplaying my knowledge of the pregnancy, I don't believe that people actually realise what they're saying about me and my character when they make them. I'm happy to explain repeatedly that due to the fact the largest piece of clothing I bought when I was pregnant was a size 10 pair of jeans, I wholeheartedly believed that there was no way I could be in that position. However, when you continue to doubt the existence of a cryptic pregnancy, this serves no other purpose than to highlight the continuous struggle women face when it comes to having their medical issues heard without being branded as hysterical or lying. If you're still under the impression that a cryptic pregnancy term is simply used to cover up a pregnancy, I would like to ask you what is really gained in the long term by lying about it. The risks around labour are known to every person with a womb, so why would you actively sit there and make a decision to put your life and your child's life at such a risk. At the end of the day, I cannot transport you into my body to know what I was feeling both pre and post birth. I don't feel like we should have a social environment still in that women have to defend themselves constantly for their birth stories. I've had women that I look up to say to me that they feel guilty for needing a C-section or that they develop postpartum depression, events that no one has any say over and yet we are the ones to continually feel guilty of them because of a lack of continued respect towards birth trauma in our society. This lack of respect and acknowledgement of the trauma that we have been through is something that echoes from my experiences of the past 18 months. Whilst the School of Architecture has been incredibly supportive and understanding, the red tape that exists within the universities as an institution is incredibly sexist against mothers who want to come back to education. When applying for exceptional factors, my case seemed to be shifted into the maternity section with little to no regard of the trauma aspect of it. I was even told at one point that I might not be able to get an extension as the university were trying to imply that my case was a maternity case alone and the fact that I had a baby without knowing I was going to have one was not enough of a case to get exceptional factors. They were trying to argue that I should be held to the same constraints in their policy as someone who's had nine months to plan. They were even discussing not giving me an extension at all because they just didn't believe that I would pass the year. Despite this, my friends who were just visiting me in the hospital were able to get extensions straight away and I had to go through a very lengthy process just to be told that it might not be successful. I don't believe that I was asking for the world with my request. I was only asking to push my first submission date to everyone else's recent dates the markers and the deadlines were already in place. So I wasn't asking for more jobs to be created or the world to be shifted around me. The School of Architecture is co-run by the University of Manchester and Manchester Metropolitan. And as far as I'm aware, there is no precedent at either university for cryptic pregnancies, nor are they included in any exceptional factors policies. You could argue that the odds are too small for it to be meaningful to put that into place. But we still have policies in place for terrorist attacks, which in the decade from 2008 to 2018, there was a 1 in 11.4 million chance of being injured in one in the UK. Now compare that to the odds of a 1 in 2,500 chance of having a cryptic pregnancy, 
quite frankly, there's no excuse for workplaces and universities to still ignore this in their policies. So what do I believe should have happened in the months after Margaret was born? Firstly, there should have been immediate mental health support to help me process what was actually going on. Whilst there was a high turnover rate in labour wards, the way that I was supposed to process what was happening to me was if, as if I had had the nine months of preparation like most expected mothers. And no one identified that my reactions were not na necessarily natural maternal instincts, but rather an area of my fight or flight response. Despite being correctly diagnosed with postpartum depression and given a referral from the NHS to my university's mental health service, I was still left for seven months with no one checking on me. This was obviously exacerbated by the fact that we have no contact with health visitors since March of 2020. I'm not ignorant to the role that COVID has probably played in this series of events, but the fact that I was able to slip through the gaps in three systems that should have provided me mental health support is quite troubling. Secondly, cryptic pregnancies need to be included in exceptional factors for universities. It's absurd that my experience was going to be boxed up into the same category as parents who had the nine months to prepare and get their affairs in order. All I was asking for was an extension. In addition to this, student finance had also recognised this event as a need for students to be able to apply for extra funding for their studies. Currently, you can apply for extra funding if your parents' financial situation changes either by their jobs or by having a child themselves within the academic year. But for you, yourself, the student, to change your financial circumstances, you have to wait for the next academic year. As far as I'm concerned, the policies in place at the moment have only served to cause extra stress on top of an already extremely stressful experience. Lastly, I believe we need more compassion in our society towards events like this. Whilst they are so far out of our realm of imagination of what could happen to us, if anything, this makes the events even more shocking to those who experience them. We need to stop vilifying women who experience these intense medical traumas that extend far past what is outwardly presented to you. The absolute last thing that a woman going through this deserves is to be shot snotty looks and made to feel like they have been completely outcasted by the same people in groups who share Instagram posts advocating for mental health and for women to be believed. You can not pick and choose what you believe women about. If you are saying that a woman is to be believed when it comes to sexual assault, then women should also be believed when it comes to their healthcare. If you are advocating for mental health and social media, then you need to actively be putting these changes into place in person. Even parents who know they were Ugh, sorry, who know that they are expecting can experience severe mental health challenges and it can be extremely jarring to see this apparent wave of support online and to be made to feel as though it should not be extended to you because of the stigma around cryptic pregnancies. A hello is not hard to say and it seriously does not go unappreciated by anyone facing challenges such as this. I am thankful to say that I am now getting the mental health support that I needed and Margot is a happy, healthy and funny 18 month old who definitely keeps us on our toes and despite the circumstances bring so much joy to so many people. I hope that sharing my story can make at least one person feel less alone and can help to challenge the stigmas around cryptic pregnancies and parents' mental health. Thank you for taking the time to listen.